Open your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 10. We are continuing our series of studies on evangelism and missions, and uh, uh, probably going to be wrapping that up, uh, not tonight, but maybe next week, uh, finishing out this series and moving on from there. But tonight, evangelism and missions as presented in the New Testament epistles. Uh, last week we looked at the, the book of Acts as a manual on church planting and arrived at the conclusion that the book of Acts is the best book in the Bible to turn to, to have a, a, a pattern, a guide for how to go about missions. Uh, how do you, what are your goals, what are you trying to do? And we spent some time with that last Wednesday night and now here in the epistles. So let me review some of what we've talked about. Some of this is clearer than, than others in our last several weeks of discussions. So this may sound like a surprising statement, but I think you'll track with me. The ultimate goal of missions is not getting people saved, nor increasing the numbers of local churches, nor the numbers of members in local churches. It is bringing God glory through spreading the honor of his name. So I shared with you the testimony. I, I knew of a, a, a man called by God to the ministry who ministered in, in the country of Jordan for 20 years as a, an ambulance driver trying to share the gospel in a Muslim majority country with very few converts. Uh, would you say that's a waste of time? No. Because God is glorified when we obey him. When, when we do what God calls us to do, when God says, be a witness, share the gospel. If you're called by God to, to ministry, to be a pastor, and God calls you to Jordan, or God calls you to other desperately, desperately needy nations, uh, the country of Turkey is almost entirely without gospel witness. Uh, and there are many others like that too, where, uh, you know, uh, Islam and other religions have just taken hold and gripped the population. Uh, in, in places like that, uh, just to go and to share the gospel, that glorifies Jesus Christ. That's our ultimate goal. It's not a numbers game. It's not, well, I planted seven churches or I led 700 people to Christ. Wonderful, that's praise the Lord. But the goal is to glorify the Lord. And, and so that's got to be the highest goal. If it's not, then there's a problem. Uh, and spreading the gospel is both the first piece of making disciples and the cornerstone of missions efforts. So the Great Commission, uh, Matthew 28, having gone therefore, make disciples of all nations. And, and it starts, you don't make a disciple of somebody who's not a believer. Uh, you've got to be a believer in Jesus Christ before you can help that individual become a disciple, a follower of Christ. And so the first piece of that, sharing the gospel, uh, leading people to Christ as the Holy Spirit uh, gives increase. And it's the cornerstone of missions efforts. So, you know, um, what do you think about going to a village somewhere and helping that village drill a well to get clean drinking water? Is that a good idea? It's a great idea, fantastic idea. That's not the same as sharing the gospel. Now, if drilling the well became a vehicle, became a, a, a way of telling people about the Lord, well, that's great. We're still not there yet, though. There, there's other pieces missing, like what? Local church. We want, to, we want to start a church. We don't just want a clean well, and we don't just want Christians in that village. We really want to help them. Let's come together, and let's become a church. Let's become a body of believers organized on the New Testament pattern. So the local church is the heart and core of missions, both in authority that is sending people out uh, and in what we're hoping to establish in other locations. So we, the, the, uh, I have known of missionaries who were kind of freelance. They went and they did some kind of great work in some other location, but they were not under the authority of a local church. And I can tell you stories that are sad and disappointing of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of money given by God's faithful people to what they thought was 
a gospel ministry, and it turned out it was something else because the individual was not under the, the supervision and the authority of a local church. Uh, and so the local church is the heart and core of missions, not only in sending, but in what we're hoping to establish. Missions is carried on both through vocationally called ordained men and by all faithful believers, ordained or not. So certainly missionaries, as we're defining it in our study, would be essentially pastors. But the Bible is very clear that all of us are supposed to be looking for opportunities to share the gospel. You don't have to be ordained. You don't have to be a man. Uh, you, wherever you are, whatever line of work you're in, wherever you live, whoever you come into contact with, you can and you're supposed to be looking for opportunities to share the gospel with people around you. So we're still reviewing. A missionary is nothing more nor less than a pastor whom God equips and sends to establish a local church. There are other kinds of servants of God, including women, Bible translators, teachers, support staff, and others who are directed by the local church to carry out a specific task or mission. Can a local church designate a woman to go and do a, a kind of ministry, kind of service for the Lord in a certain location or many locations? Of course it can, sure can. There's biblical record of that. Uh, there, there's, there's Bible verses that talk about that very thing. Uh, and so a, a church can and a woman can do all kinds of things. What should she not try to do? Pastor a church, that would be inappropriate. Um, a clear understanding of the principles found in the book of Acts and further taught in the epistles of the New Testament is foundational to a biblical model for mission. So we would encourage missionaries to study the book of Acts as a template for a philosophy of missions. Why not turn to the Bible and use the Bible as your guide on how do I do this? What am I hoping to accomplish? Well, the, the book of Acts has lots and lots of information, including Paul went to places like uh, uh, Laconia and Illyrium and Pisidian Antioch and Syrian Antioch and Thessalonica and Philippi and Ephesus. Why did he go to those places? Well, this is beyond the scope of what we're trying to do tonight, but they were population centers. They were places where people were. They were furthermore, most of them were crossroads towns, places where trade routes intersected. And if he could start a church in that location, the gospel would spread across roads and trade routes. Well, that seems like a pretty good idea. And so on. Uh, crucial to following God's plan for missions is to understand the relationship between the local church and the missionary. And we talked about that some last week. So let me run through this rather quickly. False assumptions about missions. Missions is one of those fields where we get ideas in our head and they may or may not be biblically accurate. So here's one that's pretty prevalent. If a local church has a strong missions program and or budget, then it is fulfilling its missions duty. False. Why is that false? Several reasons, but one. Okay, it's a privilege, okay. Okay, and, and one of the, the key elements of that would be uh, we can fall prey to it. Uh, we can say, well, you know, we're sending 10000 or fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year to missions. We're pretty good. We're doing our duty. Okay, so what about your next door neighbor? What about the guy that you work with at work? What about... The, the person across the street from you. Are, are you talking to them about the Lord when you have a chance, when you get an opening? Do you talk to them about their, their need for Christ? See, it's easy to put money in the offering plate, say, oh, we're good, we're, we're holy. Well, it's good to do that, it's good to give to missions, but that does not excuse us from the responsibility we have when God opens a door to tell people about the Lord Jesus. So there's more to it than this. The pastors and the deacons are supposed to witness. If they are faithful in this responsibility, then the church is okay. No, that, that's this idea of professionalism. We're the professionals, we're the trained, 
and you know, you go to the doctor because he's the professional, right? He knows what he's doing. You believe that? <laughs> well, uh, no, actually when we read Ephesians 4 carefully, the job of the pastors is to equip the people, the saints, the church, for the work of the ministry. So I am not a professional witnesser. I try with God's grace to be faithful to opportunities that he gives, but my main job is to train you. And then when you have chances to talk about the Lord, you do it. Uh, missions is sending career missionaries overseas. Well, that's a part of it. That's great, that's wonderful. We just had the chance uh, last December to meet the Philippines and we took them on for support in, in uh, January. That's great, praise God. But that's not the whole thing. What if we had an opportunity to send some of our own church family, some of our young people, like, uh, yeah, in the back row there, or over here, on a short-term mission strip? We've done that before. We, we've sent a team up to Quebec several years ago. And there are other opportunities like that that sometimes come up. Well, would we, would we say, no, 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 we're putting money in the plate, we're good? Uh, no, see. Every Christian is a missionary. No, we talked about that last, last week. When we use the term missionary, what we mean is a called, ordained pastor who is equipped to go someplace and, and work to start a church. So we wouldn't use that phrasing. Uh, every Christian is a missionary what would we say? Every Christian is a witness. Every Christian must be a witness. If we're not witnessing, when God gives us opportunity, we're not obeying the Lord completely. Uh, missionaries of third local church office, that's a false assumption. How do we arrive at that? We spent some time on that last week. First Timothy chapter three gives us qualifications for two offices not three. Uh, women are missionaries in the biblical sense. No, because a missionary in the biblical sense is a pastor. Women certainly can be, should be, when God leads them thusly, they should be all kinds of, of servants. Uh, most Many of you have met my niece uh, Tabitha, servant of the Lord in India for 11 years. And many of you know other women. I, I've known many women who served in foreign countries and stateside in all kinds of, of roles, publications, helping uh, plant a church, uh, music ministries, children's ministries, women's ministries, there, there are lots of them. But let's keep the distinction between called, ordained pastor, whom God has led to start a church, missionary in our parlance, versus something else. Only ordained men can be sent on a mission from a local church. No, a, a local church has the authority to tell anybody, we think you should go over here and do this. What if uh, we found out that a, a church uh, 30 miles or 50 miles away was struggling, they're a small group, they're trying to get going, and they said, man, we wish we had some music. The Arnott's have music. Could we send, as a church, a family to help another church? Well, sure you could. Is that missions? Well, it's a mission. The church says, we want you to do this, we're sending you. No, ah, okay. Uh, on the other hand, missions is whatever the church, local church wants it to be. Uh, you gotta be a little careful about that one. How about, um, Many, many churches start a food pantry. Uh, have to be a little careful. Why? Very easily, those kinds of social concerns can come to dominate a church. Very easily, uh, clothing giveaways and food pantries can come to be the defining characteristic of a church. And I've seen more than one church that was exactly like ours evangelical, fundamental, Baptist, 
and the, 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 the church had a heart for the local community, and they said, well, let's, let's do something to help the poor people. Let's help with food, let's help with clothing. And everybody said, yeah, that's a good idea. And initially it starts out, we give some food and we, we give a tract, a gospel tract. And after four or five years, the entire downstairs is a clothing closet. And we're giving away lots of clothes, but that has become the defining purpose of the church. And we've kind of forgotten about the gospel. Now, we wouldn't disagree for a moment that people need clothing, they need shelter, they need food. Of course they do. But is that the job of the church? You can't find that. If you look at the epistles, if you look at the New Testament, you can't find that the, the, the Lord Jesus commissioned the church to provide social support for the community. You do find we're supposed to give the gospel. We're supposed to point people to Christ. We're, we're supposed to tell them what you need more than anything else is a relationship with Christ by faith. Uh, so in order to be legitimate, missionaries have to report to supporting churches every two or four years. That's changing a little bit now, but that was the model for decades and decades. Uh, how about, um, I have a cousin who's a missionary uh, in France. And he and his wife, actually his, his wife is my cousin. Uh, Mark Nelson is his name. He works with Baptist World Mission out of uh, Alabama. They decided when they went to France 25 or 30 years ago, they were gonna raise their children. I think they have four kids now. They were gonna raise their children to speak French like a French person and they were gonna stay in country. They would only come back to the States when absolutely necessary for funerals and weddings and like that. And uh, they were saying, we are going to try to influence, we're gonna to try to start a church and we want our family to be French in order to share the gospel, in order to lead people to Christ. And <clears throat> they did not give up their US citizenship but they did stay in the field for a long time. What do you think? How does that work? So the French field is extremely difficult. French people are highly secular, nominal Catholic, but really not, not religious at all. Uh, and they're very proud of their culture, very resistant. They look at uh, anything that is not Catholicism and is not secularism, they think of as a cult. So heavy duty resistance. They have started a church. And I don't think it's quite to self support yet, but close after 25 years or so. Their kids speak French way better than their parents do. And uh, they have a very powerful witness. They've influenced many other churches in the south of France. So I think that's a pretty interesting concept. Would that be the model for everybody? No, but it, I think it was for them. Okay, so let's talk for a few minutes about what the, the epistles teach us about evangelism. So Romans 10.1, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Paul is talking about Israel and we have many other places, Ephesians 6, Colossians 4, 2 Thessalonians 3. I'll just read that last one, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did with you, and that we'll be rescued from perverse and evil men, for not all have faith. And the point I'm making is, since the sharing of the gospel is a spiritual act, and the salvation of people is a divine act, what do I mean by that? Divine, what, what does that mean, divine act? It's from God. God does it. We don't save anybody. Missionaries don't save people. Preachers don't save people. Christians don't save people. There's only one person who can save, and that's Jesus Christ. It's a divine act, and it's a spiritual act. It's not an intellectual act. It's not, I'm gonna go persuade somebody to believe in Jesus because I'm smarter than they are, I'm eloquent, I have powerful language, and I'm gonna just use my best arguments 
and in an hour they'll believe. No, no, it's not like that. I don't have the ability to persuade anybody to believe in Jesus. It is not an intellectual matter at all. It is a spiritual matter. With that in mind, I gotta pray. I need God's help. Missionaries need God's help. Do you think that missionaries save people? They don't save anybody. They go and they talk to people the same as you would do to your next door neighbor. And they try to establish a rapport and they try to talk to them about the love of God. And they try to talk to, to them about accountability. And well, but we can't persuade anybody to get saved because it's a spiritual, it's a heart matter. And so this means we got to pray. We should pray for our missionaries. When, when we get those uh, uh, missionary newsletters by email from, from Rachel, don't just read it and say, well, that's interesting. No, you read it and you pray for what the, the missionaries are telling us about. They're working with this person. And they say, we've got such a burden. Some of the most effective missionaries that I've ever met, some of the most powerful, compassionate people I've, I've ever known are the Stevens in Boston. We had them here several years ago, and Rachel does send those out. And, and they have such a heart for people, and they're meeting people all the time, trying to build a relationship. Pray for them. We, we've got to have God's help. And furthermore, Galatians chapters 2 and 3, and here's where Peter comes and uh, Paul confronts him and says, hey, you're not being clear about the gospel. Uh, you said one thing and now you're doing something else. What, what gives? What's going on? A clear understanding of the gospel. We need to know what the gospel is. And we, we've discussed it at some length a few weeks back. Uh, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and he rose again the third day uh, according to the scripture. So Christ died for our sins. Remember that? For our sins. Critical. He died for our sins. And then he rose again. Jesus Christ gave his life to pay for our sins. And then he conquered death. That's the gospel. How do you receive? How do you accept the gospel? Belief. Belief. Believe plus nothing else. Not believe and, and pray the rosary. Not believe and participate in the sacraments. Not believe and try to be a good person. Not believe and go to church. No, believe plus nothing. And we, we, we offer this to people. This is salvation. This is what saves people. And then uh, out of Colossians 4 and 1 Peter 3, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you'll know how you should respond to each person. And similar uh, wisdom given in 1 Peter 3.15. Uh, talking with others about Jesus and eternal life through faith in him alone is, is supposed to be a natural, normal part of the Christian experience. So this is part of who we are and what we do. It, it's organic. Uh, and in my experience, the more you do it, the more natural it becomes. Uh, what's the best way to overcome fear of witnessing? Witness. Witness. You know, I have read books on it. I've attended courses on it. Probably you have too. Uh, after I read a book, I say, well, that's good stuff. And then I meet somebody and they, they raise a question and I get the butterflies in my stomach and I, my mouth goes dry. And I, <laughs> well, how do you get over that? You open your mouth and you say, so do you know the Lord Jesus personally? And it's hard, it's scary, but you do it and the Lord will honor that. I'm not saying everybody you witness to will, will even treat you nicely, <laughs> uh, but remember, our ultimate goal is not even to get them saved. Our ultimate goal is to glorify God. And when we obey him, he is glorified. So this is supposed to be a natural, normal part of the Christian experience. Other things that we learn about evangelism and missions in the epistles, 
Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Out of Philippians 2, prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach. Conduct yourselves with wisdom. Out of 1 Thessalonians 4, make your ambition to lead a quiet life, attend to your own business, work with your own hands. As part of the Christian life and as a natural parallel to our words about Jesus Christ, the believer's lifestyle is supposed to be different from that of the world around them. So uh, picture a scene at work and here's a Christian and he has a burden to share the gospel with his coworkers and uh, somebody uh, says something a little snarky to him and he gets mad, he gets, he gets uh, enraged, he gets red in the face and he starts shouting at people around him and then half an hour later somebody who wasn't on the scene comes up and says, so yesterday you, say, you said you're going to talk to me about Jesus. And everybody's watching them. What did he do? Destroyed his testimony. He ruined any positive effect he might have had because his words and his behavior, his lifestyle, does not match what he's about to say. Oh, Jesus loves you. And Jesus knows about your sin. And Jesus can deal with your sin problem. Come on, pal, uh, you just got mad and you let her rip a minute ago, and now you're gonna try to impress me with, with your God? Right. Uh, actions speak louder than words. Attitudes speak louder than words. And it's amazing how much damage a 30 second tirade can cause to 30 years of Christian testimony. People will, will remember your blow up or your snark or your, whatever it is. They will remember that long after they've forgotten that you invited them to church. Well, the, the two are supposed to match, see? Our, our testimony, our witness, our desire to share the gospel is supposed to match and go along with my lifestyle. I'm different. I don't have to respond in anger to problems. I don't have to wilt in tears when something doesn't go my way. I don't have to be like that because I have the Holy Spirit. I'm going to hurry. Uh, in evangelism, as in all parts of the Christian life, the believer is supposed to show a genuine enthusiasm, joy, and excitement about his relationship to Christ. Uh, and these uh, references here are to joy. This is a pet peeve of mine. And maybe it's a pet peeve because maybe it's an area that I struggle with. <laughs> I, I hope not, but uh, I, I am concerned that Christians present themselves to the world with kind of a, a noblesse oblige uh, idea, an idea of, uh, well, I'm, I'm a Christian and it's, it's hard and the whole world is again me, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna put up with it. And, and I know that God has called us all to, to bear a heavy load. Why is anybody going to be attracted to that? Why is anybody going to say, well, I want what you have? They're, they're going to say, uh, yeah, you have a good day now. I'm, I'm going to slip out the side door. Why don't we look like we claim we are inside? Why don't we smile? Why don't we look people in the, in the face and give them a big smile? How are you today? And mean it. Not like in New England where we say things and we don't actually mean it. <laughs> Not like that. But we look people in the eye and we smile. And when we say, how are you? We wait for a reply. And, and if we sense, you know, they, they hesitate for a minute or they open their mouth like they, they want to say something, we're actually accessible, and we're smiling, and we're showing people, even though everybody in this room has problems. We all of us have health issues, or family issues, or money issues, or job issues, or many more besides. But if we really mean what these verses teach, we have joy. Why in the world doesn't that show? What is the matter with us that we can't emote, we can't exude genuine joy 
that would attract people to the gospel. Well, see, that's what we're supposed to do. I'm done. Questions or comments? And then we'll take prayer requests. Yes, sir. Yeah. Selfless yes. service to missions is not, I think, Amen. And that should, that should have been on that. That's an excellent point, Justin. Thank you. So I am acquainted with, in two different areas, uh, the truth that Justin was just pointing out. Sometimes a church gets it in its head. It's even more spiritual, even more godly, to support foreign missions or home missions than it is to take care of its own pastor. So I know of a church in Pennsylvania where the, the pastor uh, got a social security check, he was, he was up in years, and he told the church, let's take the money that you would give me as a salary and put it into missions. And the church was fine with that, and that pastor was too. Here's the problem. A couple of years later, his wife got sick. He had to retire from the ministry. And now the church is supporting missions to the tune of eighteen dollars or $20,000, and the pastor's salary is 4000 what do you do now? Do, do, can you get a young guy and come in and he'll come in with you know, three or four kids and a wife and he'll say, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll serve the Lord for four grand. Uh, that's a problem, you can see that. The other one is even more personal. A few of you might remember this. In 2008, we faced that situation right here. And there was money in missions, but uh, the situation was such that I was facing a decision, should I go look for a secular job to supplement what the church was able to do for me? And the church very courageously faced that head on, asked the hard questions, and said, we are going to suspend our missions support until such time that we can re-engage, and we're gonna take the money that was going to missions and give it to Pastor Brown. And here's an interesting thing. Before that time, uh, 2008, quite often the, 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 the amount of money that we took in was a little bit less than what we needed. <laughs> From that time on, we have always run a surplus. Huh. We did you know, I believe the church did the right thing. And it's not, I'm not saying that just because I'm the recipient of that, that gift, that grace. But I believe that that is the biblical model. So, excellent point. Thank you, Justin. Other questions, comments? I was determined to finish sooner tonight. And I almost did. 